This is A Conversation With, brought to you by the Conference Board's Human Capital Center. Hello, I'm Rebecca Ray, Executive Vice President and Leader of the Human Capital Center here at the Conference Board. I'm delighted to bring to you the very first in the A Conversation With podcast series. Recently, I had the great good fortune to sit down with our very, very first um, guest, and that would be uh, Dave Ulrich. And you know him as well as, as so many of us who have been the beneficiaries of his insights over the years. He's uh, often thought of as the father of modern HR. He's a college professor at the University of Michigan's Business School. He's the founder of the RBL Group. He's part of the Thinkers 50. He's part of uh, Marshall Goldsmith's 100. He is arguably among the most influential thinkers in our profession today. And he certainly has a long list of accolades and honors to prove it. So I'm delighted uh, to, uh, to share with you some of the thoughts that Dave shared, and we bring this to you now. I'm really excited today uh, to, to welcome you and also to begin uh, with Dave Ulrich. You know, I, I can't imagine someone who would be a, a, a better uh, candidate to start. I also can't imagine setting a higher bar, and I'm so thrilled uh, to be here today with Dave Ulrich. You know, as a as a, a former chief talent officer, I've certainly been the beneficiary of his wisdom over the years, and I'm just absolutely thrilled. So welcome, Dave. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you. What a what a privilege to uh, join you in the conference board and an inaugural of what we hope is one of many conversations. Thank you. Very good. Well, you know, Dave, I'm conscious that you're a man who needs no introduction, and yet there is an introduction slide. So let me just uh, put that up on the screen for a moment. You know, that's I my think, younger uh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all of us have had an opportunity, I think, to uh, to read your books or to work personally with you and to to benefit from that. Uh, but uh, for those who may be newer to the profession, uh, certainly Dave is a an active um, member of the University of Michigan uh, Business School program. You can see that he is the uh, Rensis Liker. Uh, collegiate professor of business administration, and he heads the uh, human resources uh, program there at the University of Michigan. Um, about uh, 20 years ago, he founded the RBL Group with uh, Norm Smallwood, and he has no end to the number of accolades. He's the author of more than 30 books. He's been honored uh, with the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award from HR Magazine back in 2012. You can see that he's been named, it was one of the uh, the top gurus, just at about any list you look at, whether that's the uh, management guru list from um, Business Week or Fast Companies list of the top creative people in business. Uh, it's just a real privilege uh, to have you uh, with us today, Dave. So thank you for saying yes. Thank you. So I thought that perhaps uh, Dave and I might uh, kick around a, a few ideas, um, and I, I'd love to get your thoughts, Dave. And then, uh, you know, in a few moments, we'll we'll open this to uh, some some questions that the group might have. But I, I wondered if, from your very unique perspective, if you might characterize sort of the state of our profession. So if you if you look at where we are in the landscape, I, I imagine there are some things that you would point to as accomplishments, places where we perhaps have done very well, and then some areas where we need to continue to focus because we're not quite there yet. But could you share your, your point of view? Sure. You know, I sure appreciate the privilege, Rebecca, and, and appreciate people taking uh, their sacred time to, to have a conversation. Um, my passion, and it's a passion over decades, is, and thanks for reminding me that you've known me a long time, so I am old, and that was obviously my younger brother in the picture, but um, I'm always interested in where we go next in HR, and for me, the state of the profession is not just what is, but what can be, and so let me highlight a couple of places where I hope we in HR, HR can go. And for those who are listening, uh, we have not scripted this. So we hope this is a conversation uh, between Rebecca and I and then among all of us. One of the places where I hope we go in HR is to recognize that HR is not about HR. HR is not about what we know and do in human capital or human resources, but it's about the value we create as we do that. And so it's not about... Uh, training or compensation or succession planning. It's what's the value created from those sets of activities. Um, and for me, that value creation question is emerging and growing. 
uh, it's evolving. Let me give one example of that and I'll make two other points and then get back, Rebecca, to a conversation. I was in a meeting recently um, with a group of very senior and talented senior HR professionals. And, and it hit me an interesting question and let me frame it for those listening. What's the most important thing HR or human capital or business leaders working with people can give an employee in the organization? I asked this question yesterday at the University of Michigan in one of our programs, and I asked it last week to a group of senior business leaders, and the answers are almost all the same. We can give them purpose and belief and opportunity and leadership and passion and careers and compensation and rewards. My comment is different. What's the most important thing we can give employees? And for me, the answer is an organization that wins in the marketplace. Without having an organization that wins in the marketplace, almost everything else is moot. Everything else is moot. You got purpose, you got succession, you got leadership. Unless those things add value to the marketplace, we don't succeed. Let me just give a quick example of that, and then maybe I'll stop. I have some other points, but I may stop there. At the University of Michigan, we're running a program right now. We hope some people will look at, but we said, what do you want to leave this program knowing? And it was uh, issues around succession, around talent, around uh, reward systems, around global organization. And I had people after I did that little uh, exercise, what's the most important thing we can give an employee is an organization that wins. Go stand by what they wrote and put two words behind it. So that, so that. I want to learn more how to engage our employees in a better employee experience so that and the so that should lead me outside the organization. It's not about the employee experience that matters. It's the employee experience so that our customers, our investors, our communities outside have a better impression of what we do inside. So, Rebecca, for me, that's the mega message where I hope we in HR seem to be headed is not about HR for HR's sake but HR so that we help win in the markets we serve. You know, Dave, I think, I think that's critically important because it is the reason why human resources and its attendant professionals exist. It's, it's not simply so that we can amaze others with our compensation schemes or so that we can build a leadership development program that wins awards. It is so that we have employees that we can attract and retain and develop so that they can have a successful organization. Totally um, agree. And, and yeah. what's exciting for me is when we see the right analytics that Patty Phillips and you and others have done, those analytics are not about the activity, how many people went to training. That's okay. you know, how many people got 40 hours of training. That's not very interesting. How did that experience of training cause customers or investors or communities outside the organization to have a different understanding and experience? And I'm sorry I cut you off, but for me, that's an exciting agenda that, that I keep thinking about. And, and I know you're doing the same at, at your human uh, capital work in, in the conference board. Yeah, you know, I think that raises the issue of metrics. And I know a lot of folks in our profession are not comfortable um, with metrics. I know sometimes when we've, I know you've done a lot of work with helping investors understand, you know, quality work and what makes a successful organization. And particularly when it comes to um, targets or investments or mergers and acquisitions. But a lot of folks, I think, are very uncomfortable with the metrics conversation and are very concerned that those are now going to be the benchmarks against which they will need to perform. And those are not things like how many people came through a training program. That's about uh, how much did you grow market share as a result of the additional skills that your folks had because they had some of the activities that you led. How do I say amen, amen, amen? I think the metrics field in HR, uh, we actually did a study and we uh, collected data on skills of HR people and what they knew how to do. And one of the skill sets was HR analytics. Can you build an HR scorecard? And then we correlated, or we did regressions, with those skills and business performance. Here's what we found. We did analytics of analytics, if you can be so bold. Mm -hmm. HR people who were better at doing analytics did not have a business impact. Ah! I mean, and, and our takeaway was, it's not about HR analytics, it's about business analytics. 
that and 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 I did a book with some others called the HR Scorecard. Today, okay. I would argue that book's terrible. It's out of date. We don't want to build an HR scorecard. We want to evolve beyond it. We want to have a scorecard that says, what's the impact of those HR activities? As you said so well, employee engagement or experience is not the outcome. How do we correlate employee experience with customer experience? Disney doesn't do all their incredible employee experience things so that their employees are well-being and happy. They're doing them so that I, as a guest, will pay $130 a day to go to Disney. And, and when we can make those bridges, that's where I think we in HR are having much more impact. Yeah, I, I do think that we sometimes get caught up in the fact that we are able to, to measure some things, but we also don't have the skill set that takes us to that next level. And so therefore we sort of yeah. get trapped in what we can measure and what we can get our heads wrapped around. Well, I, I do know- We measure what's easy, not what's right. Exactly do, right. You know, we measure. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. You know, I I wonder though if our profession, generally speaking, has sort of failed the profession in some ways because we've all known the advent of big data and analytics was coming for a long time, and we've helped people be anxious about it. I don't know that we have spent the requisite time helping people develop the skills with which to step into that arena and well compete said. and win. Uh, well said. I think. You know, big data is not new to HR. Um, when did the Phillips do their first book? Or when did Josh Burson do some of his early books? I I can't Long remember. And Jack it's Fitzsense. Been, it's been and, decades, yep. You know, the, my PhD decades ago was in numerical taxonomy. It was in big data. And I did big data sets. In fact, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, I shut down the UCLA computer system because I had such a big data set. I had to go at midnight and meet the ghouls who operated at UCLA at midnight. Today, you could do that in a nanosecond. But I think what we've got to get is from the insights from the big data that will have impact. And it's not about getting data. We can find data. Data is available. How do you get insights that will really have impact? And again, not just on employee well-being. That's a great idea. We all believe in that. But on customer well-being, on, for example, in leadership, we've been privileged to participate for a few times in the top companies for leadership study that Fortune and and uh, I've lost the Aon Hewitt have done. We get a set of leadership skills. Most companies have a competency model, but we haven't done what my partner Norm Smallwood says, the money ball. So which of those 10 competencies for leaders has most business impact? That's the stuff that I think we've got to begin in HR to get our heads around is HR is not about HR. It's about the impact we can have on helping the business move forward. So Dave, when you look at the evolution of sort of where we've we've come, if you could point to a couple of things or a couple of areas that you think as a profession, and I recognize fully that everyone's on a spectrum somewhere, so some are really advanced and you know doing great things and some are earlier in their in their journey. But what would you point to are things that as a profession we've generally done pretty well? I think we're moving in the right direction. And for me, profession is a pivot. A pivot doesn't mean people say from and to, and I try to avoid that because I think you build on the past. I think you pivot. I think we're moving from functional excellence to, to strategic HR to outside in and the outside in logic. And I think that journey we're beginning to get. I think another journey we're beginning to get is who are our uh, stakeholders, not the employees inside, but the customers outside. That's the outside in. A second journey for me is a really important one. And and I often do this as an exercise. So I'll do it as an exercise. If you're in a room with other people, you might choose it or you might not. And I won't have Rebecca do it, but I say, hold up five fingers, that's talent, that's people, that's the workforce, and hold up a fist. That's not talent, that's the fingers, that's the organization, that's the culture. It's not the workforce, it's the workplace. It's not the people, it's the process. It's not the competence, it's the capability. Again, with the bias on creating value in terms of business value, when we do regressions, and we just did a big study um, with 1,200 businesses and 30-some thousand people, what matters more on business results? Is it the people, the war for talent, workplace, or workforce, or is it the organization, the culture? What's the regression? What's the statistic? And what we found, four to one, the system. So I think the pivot in HR is you've got to get good people. Nobody doubts that. People matter. We need good employee experiences. 
But if you have good people who don't work well together as a system, as a team, building the organization that's better than any individual, we're not going to have sustainable business results. So my sense is, Rebecca, trend number one is from functional excellence to strategic HR to outside in. Evolution number two is from talent to organization. And so when I'm an HR person sitting in a, in a, in a meeting with a set of business leaders, I ask the question, do we have the right people? No question. We got to have good people. Do we have the right organization? And for me, the intersection, and I'll finish this, the intersection between people and organization is leadership. So for me, the pivot in the field, a pivot in the field is from talent to organization and leadership, learning to become uh, thoughtful in all of those outcomes. You know, I, uh, I'm glad to hear you say that. I think the leadership piece is so critical, and I don't think it's ever been tougher to be a leader than it is now. And I don't, I don't, I, I don't mean to to not value people who've led through times of war and massive, you know, upheaval. And I, so I, I, I greatly respect that. But I think there was, except, I would say most of the time there was some some kind of expectation of what the future might look like. There was some kind of sense of continuity, some reasonable guesses as to what the future would be. And I don't think we have that as much anymore. I, and I, I know there's certain leadership core skills that will never go away, like empathy and developing other people and being customer focused and all of that. But it's the uncertainty of not knowing the world into which you must then convince people to willingly follow you. And right. that's so key. I, uh, by the way, you've done studies on leadership. You've been a chief talent officer. You've been in other groups in the conference board. Uh, if I were to ask you, and I'll give mine, and then I'm going to ask you, and you're not going to be biased by mine, because I know you have such a great yeah. independent point of view. If I were giving leaders a set of uh, coaching advice about what are some key things you personally must know and do so that you build leadership depth, so it's not about you, it's about others, what would I encourage? Here's some of what I would say, and then I'm going to ask if I, we could get your views. Now, at the base, you've got to be authentic, trustworthy authenticity you don't you don't you don't get to play if you're not authentic a second one for me is we e pivot and evolve is emotional intelligence you've got to be self-aware your unconscious bias your ability to work with others your emotional intelligence pivoting up a third level is capacity and you just hit it well learning resilience grit growth mindset whatever that bucket is the ability to adapt to an unknown future let me add a fourth that we're starting to see, and then I'd love to get yours. So, and 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 you can't get there if you don't if you're not authentic. Nobody's going to let you in the room. If you if you're not emotionally aware, nobody's going to spend time with you. If you're not learning and growing, you're going to be out of date. But the one we're finding right now that's fascinating is navigating paradox. In a world of uncertainty, paradox is two guardrails. Should we be short term or should we be long term? Should we be top down or bottom up? Should we zoom out with vision or zoom in with action? Should we have um, convergence or divergence? And my answer to leaders today is yes. <laughs> Should I be a top down leader and be in charge? Yes. Should I be an engaging leader and develop others? Yes. And what we're starting to find in our research and experience is authenticity, absolutely. Um, emotional intelligence, absolutely. Learning grit, growth, absolutely. But learning to navigate those guardrails and those paradoxes is what may differentiate leaders going forward. That's some of what we've seen. I'd love to hear yours and uh, if you were helping kind of propose some of that. Sure. So you, we do a, an annual uh, report each year. We reach out to CEOs and C-suite leaders around the world and we ask them what are some other hot buttons and the things that they're concerned about. And the focus this year was around what will the organization of the future look like. And so when we ask these folks to tell us uh, what they thought success would look like. They actually said it was an organization that was able to balance short-term and long-term challenges. Wow. And That's that was cool. spot on, spot on. That's so cool. Uh, you know, I haven't seen the report. I uh, That is so cool because to get this paradigm, it's kind of like an airplane. It's flying, if you're in Washington, D.C. and somebody's in Detroit, there's a string. How long is the airplane on that string? And the answer is not very often. It goes this way and this way. That's leadership today. And one of the paradoxes is self-leadership. I am the leader. I am the, the woman or the man in charge. And I create leadership. 
how do you navigate that one? And I love that issue. I'll be really honest. I don't have it fully understood yet. How's that for being candid? How could I get investors and customers to say that organization navigates, it doesn't manage, it doesn't solve paradox, it navigates inherent tensions. And as a result, I, the investor, will give that organization a premium. And again, that's where I hope we in HR begin to go. I, I hope so, because I, I think I, I'm beginning to think that being a leader is almost bigger than a single person. And so if, nice. if, if part of what you do as a leader and the way in which you ought to be judged is how many other leaders you create. Oh, oh, so, I, but we, <laughs> if we should high five. Put up your hand. We've just yes, high fived or yes, fist butted. High five. Uh, high five. Um, there we go. Leadership is not about me leadership leaders is about how I've made somebody else a better leader. I, I interviewed somebody once and he said, I'm a great leader because I'm a billionaire. And my comment to him was, have you created a thousand millionaires? Yeah. Because a billionaire means I can do something. Leadership is about creating the next generation and leaders who empower others to become their own leaders are successful. I'm a quick anecdote. I'm so sorry. I'm getting carried away because I love this stuff so much. No, I hope great. you feel the passion. Absolutely. I happen to be coaching a woman right now who is just off the wall incredible. And it's a privilege to meet people. She'd be embarrassed if I said her name, but uh, grew up in the Philippines, poor, went to a school, not learning to read and write, ended up the valedictorian at a Catholic school, went to college, valedictorian, Harvard, MIT, double PhDs. She's now got a life story, six languages, She's the president of a 40,000 person university and everybody wants her to tell her story. Would you tell your story? Cause it's so compelling and I get goosebumps. They videotape it. My counsel to her is stop it, which is counterintuitive. Leadership is not about you telling your story. It's about helping 40,000 students create their story. And, 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 and one quick example, I was in a meeting with her and her team and they were going through all the data and enrollments, registrations and all the things leaders do. And I said, this doesn't feel like we're helping someone create a story. And she said, let me tell you a quick story. The school that we're in charge of, the 10 uh, executives of the school, are trying to create a school that's open to everybody. I just met with a 32-year-old woman, by the way, this is a very touching story for me, whose husband five years ago found out he had cancer. She immediately started school part-time because we created a school that would let her do that. Five years later, her husband is a few months from passing away. They have three children. She came to me and said, thank you, doctor, for creating this university where I can get a degree. And as my husband leaves, I'll be able to take care of my children. And I said, what a sweet story. That's leadership. It's not you. And Rebecca, you have a great story. I've been around you enough. Your story is not what ins your story. I, I said that wrong. Your story does inspire others, but ultimately, if you can help other people create their story, then you become a leader. And that's what I see you trying to do at the conference board. You're not trying to say, "Oh, we're so smart. We've done all this stuff." You're saying, "Here's some ideas that will help you create your story." And when leaders no, do that, they build the future. That, that's exactly right. I mean, we're we're in the business here at the conference board of helping other people learn great stories that they can learn from and steal all the good ideas. But, but I loved your comment about, you know, navigating paradox. And it kind of brings me back to, you can't do this job alone. And if you don't have people who feel empowered and are comfortable helping you sort out what can't be known, that's the only way you're going to be able to navigate through that paradox because you cannot figure it out on your own. Absolutely. And and that's that's the thing I keep coming back to is have you built a team that functions very well without you? Thank you very much. And could pick up then just run with whatever they knew the mission to be. You know, I love it. And if I could come back and push a little bit, I mean, I love the concept of guardrails. So you're going down a trail to Machu Picchu. That could be someplace somebody wants to visit. And you've got guardrails on the road. One of those guardrails is solo. I, I operate by myself, I'm independent thinker. The other guardrail is team. 
Here's the yeah. challenge. Know when to go where. If you live on one or the other guardrail alone, if it's only teamwork, I yeah. think a good leader says, I'm going to diverge. I'm going to get the team together. We're going to brainstorm. And then I may need to go off by myself into that Machu Picchu mountain and, and ponder and reflect and say, what's going on here that I need to ponder? And so knowing when to navigate those two tensions become so critical. And that's what I heard you just say. It's not just teamwork. It's not just solo leadership. It's how do I know when to navigate which? And one of the things we've tried to say to leaders is know your predisposition. Know your pre. I tend to work by myself. Okay, I got to get out of my predisposition and get a team. I tend to be team oriented. Get out of that and go work by myself. Again, I'm struggling to figure this out as, as, and there are smarter people than me working on this, but how do I help investors see that leaders who can navigate those paradoxes are going to create companies that win in an uncertain and changing world? You know, I, I, I think, I think it does start with recognizing that you cannot do it and you do not know. And, yeah. and you can't be authentic if in your head it's, I'm this leader and I've got to have the answers and I've got to look a certain way and I've got to behave a certain way. And, you know, I, I, some of the most impressive leaders I've had the privilege to, to get to know uh, have been people who just broke all the rules. They, yeah. they, they, they spoke in ways that were different. They, they hugged. They did whatever. It was just different, you know, from the things yeah. that you're taught. So. Well, well I, it, you know, I'm laughing with you. I'm thinking of some of those leaders. Watch the videotapes of Steve Ballmer at Microsoft. Just go nuts. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's not a prototype. Uh, he's not, uh, and and yet and yet he knows how to navigate paradox. He knows when to be tough. He knows when to be soft. He knows when to engage and when to direct. Zoom out and zoom in. And 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 that's what we're trying to help leaders begin to get. Ambidextrous leadership is a word people have used. When we can make that happen, I'm just very excited. Well, my hope is that uh, with, you know, generations that are coming into the workplace now and, you know, starting to assume leadership positions, that they have the advantage of not being locked into a particular way of well being said. as a leader. And, and that's well my said. hope. I think I think they're going to force authenticity where it may not have taken root yet, um, because I don't think there's well a said. tolerance for for not having it, you know, so. Well said. Well, I'd like, so I'd like if, you were, if, you, if you were doing a study on leadership and said, this is what I hope investors and customers look for in better leaders, what would, what would, you, what would you put at top of the list? I, I put paradox in there. Maybe you'd put that. Maybe you'd put authenticity. What would you put in top of the list? You've, you've got such a great insight. I think I'd look to see how strong is the whole leadership cadre because got an it. organization got survives it. if it's greater than the sum of its parts. And and if you look at how often they can fill internal positions or how many companies are sort of an academy company for leaders who then go to other organizations and bring excellence there and just, you know, I, I think you and I could probably, you know, rattle off a few names and I'm sure you've coached or worked with many of them, but they just have something about them that inspires others to be not like them, but to learn from them to be their own kind of leader. But some of the essential core things are, are, are just right. Are just right. So I, I think I would look to see, yeah, how, how how well have you built a team? How how many leaders have you built? And can they can they go off and replicate excellence? Because I think you know, good I, leaders I, can be brought to a lot of places and be successful. You know. I love that because, and I know you have maybe a few other questions, you may have comments, but in, in large companies, when you start a business, you, you import capital, you get money, and then you try to export and make money. I think mm -hmm. you also import human capital. And one of the yeah. metrics, and I know you love metrics, is ingress versus import versus export of talent not only leaders, but are you a net importer? And there's a time when you should be an importer. If I'm starting up a new business, I import talent. But over time, am I an exporter of talent? Do people who have worked for me become better in other spots? And I think that's just, let me just, uh, another, we just did another high five. Uh, that's a great insight. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, Dave, we've talked about you know leadership and we've talked about how you know the profession is making this this pivot uh maybe before we uh we take some additional questions could i just ask if you if you were to to meet with an organization or you would meet with you know groups of um earlier in career human capital professionals coming through 
what would be the areas where you think we ought to, as a profession, spend more time? Because we don't have this quite right. Um, one of the things I believe is when there's low variance, we know what to do. There's not going to be differential advantage. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of the administrative work of HR that we've outsourced, that we now insource, that we put on technology, there's not much variance in how we do that, how we source people, how we review people. I think the places where we get the most impact and differential advantage is where there's high variance. And so I'd encourage the, the next generation who want to have an impact to say, wade into the places where you don't have easy answers. How do you build the right culture? How do you build what you call the, the organization that makes them more than the more than the parts? And you say, well, there's no I don't have a I don't have a recipe. I don't have a three step, four step agenda for that. My answer is don't play in the four step recipes. Play in the areas where there's menus of options and we don't know the right answer. So organizational culture, it's not about the values, it's about the right values more than the parts. How do you build an adaptive agile organization? How do you help people find their own accountability for making sure that they have success in a company. How do you how do you move talent, leadership, and organization forward in ways that make a difference with customers, with investors, and with communities? And so I'd encourage people to wade into the messy areas and then try to find uh, innovative solutions. And it's okay to be messy. It's okay to be messy because if you look at, uh, I want a three-step answer to succession planning. No, there isn't a three-step answer. You know, it, it requires some real judgment about what's the future of the business. What are the organizational requirements we have? Anyway, so I'd, I'd encourage people to walk into some messy areas. Uh, yeah. for, I'll give you one example, and, and it comes up in your conversation and mine and, and the work by Jack and Patty Phillips. We need information. Information is the root of analytics. So yes, we need data analytics, but information is the root. Here's a messy area. About 20% of the information we have in the world is in spreadsheets. So you do statistics. My PhD is in statistics. I do regressions. I do clustering analyses. 80% of the information is not in a spreadsheet. It's in observation. It's in what we see. It's what we feel. I, I, You've been in a lot of companies. When you go visit a, a company at the end of the morning or the end of the day, I'd love to ask you not what you got in the spreadsheet, the engagement survey, the retention data. What did you feel? Right. I think that's one of those paradoxes. And I think yeah. that's an area that's a little messy. How do we how do we feel comfortable with unstructured data? I can give one quick example. Um, I'm doing a plant tour with a group of other leaders. Um, we go through the plant for two hours. Everybody's doing a presentation. They've got their charts. They've got their statistics, and they're all doing lean. And at the end of the two hours, one of the people I was with, and boy, did I miss this. He looked at the plant manager, and he looked at the president of the company who we were accompanying, and he said, you have a problem in your plant. What's the problem? Everybody was well-dressed. They were organized. The plant was clean. It was all staged. In the two hours, not once – did you come out of our tour group and not once did an employee come out of his or her operation and have a personal conversation? Oh. How's your child? What matters to you? What's on your bucket list? Your, your, your spouse just was in the hospital. Your mother's hurting. Not once in two hours did I see some of that personal affect. And I think you got a problem. You're looking at the empirical data, not the subjective data. That's the kind of stuff I hope we can help our HR people. Uh, sometimes we run away from it because it's, quote, soft. But sometimes in that soft data come marvelous insights. So that's, uh, that's another paradox, and that's a place where I hope we in HR are not afraid to go. You know, I, I couldn't agree more because some of the most important things are the messiest things. So I, I, I think about culture in an organization like character in a human being. And, you know, it takes a long time to build it. And it's probably the most important thing. And it takes uh, not very long to ruin it. And so, you know, <laughs> I just, and that's why I think the culture work, if I, if I ever had it to do over again, I would want to sit at the, at the intersection of inclusion and engagement and culture and work there specifically in an organization. Because I think that's where the exciting, important work is for us now. 
Tough. I'd agree. And, and, and if I could take your hands and here's inclusion, here's engagement, here's culture, these are inside. My other hand would be linking that to the outside customer. Yep. Because are we building a culture that will cause customers to be closer to us? Leadership. One of my friends in advertising is now going to the big four ad agencies and saying, build your advertising message, your brand, your message, and link that to your leadership training program. So that the training we do for leaders is consistent with what we're promising customers. So I love your inclusion, engagement, culture, these internal pieces connected to the external pieces. Yeah. What, a, what a wonderful area. Well, well, thank you. I, I think that I run the risk of just sitting here and talking to you all day because that would be very, very tempting. Um, but I think what I'd like to do, if it's all right, is, is to shift gears a little bit and share some of the questions that have been coming in and, and get your thoughts. This has been A Conversation With, brought to you by the Conference Board's Human Capital Center.